That's him. I very seldom can sing it without breaking down because of the great truths in it. In 1981, Amy was, had a relapse of her leukemia. We were down at the University of Minnesota and they gave her less than 10% chance to make the year. We came back to worship First Baptist Church of Wilmer on Easter Sunday. And the choir sang, because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow. And then two years ago when my mom died, at the funeral, this is one of the hymns that my mom had picked. And what a privilege it was to lead the congregation in singing because he lives. Let's turn in our scripture today to Matthew 27. We're going to read the end of that chapter and we're going to read the entire chapter 28 of Matthew. Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 27, verse 62 and following. Reading from God's holy word. On the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night, steal him away, and say to the people, He's risen from the dead. So the last deception is worse than the first. Pilate said to him, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it secure as you know how. So they went, they made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy ran to bring his disciples word and as they went to tell his disciples behold Jesus met them saying rejoice so they came and held him by the feet and they worshiped him then Jesus said to them do not be afraid go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me now while they were going behold some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened and when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them, his disciples came at night, and they stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money, and they did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we just pray now, as we have read your word of truth, revelation, from you, disclosing things to us which would not otherwise have been made known, the miracle of it all. And we thank you for this word of truth. And now we pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit of truth would convict us of this living truth, that it would be lived out in each one of us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Friends, this is the most important day in Christianity. Easter. Easter Lord's Day. Have you ever thought of it that Christmas exists because of Easter? It's not the other way around. This is also the day that the pews are typically filled in America as no other time in the year. Did you know that back in the 1990s, Gallup did a poll and they said that 60% of Americans attended a church meeting on Easter. And that one-fourth of them in attendance did not even know what Easter meant. I'm afraid if we took that same Gallup poll today, it would be less than 60% when you have 20% of Americans now that have no church affiliation at all. And that number is ever increasing exponentially. And also, Americans are less and less religious as days go by. Less and less Christian, let's say, as days go by. Well, there's a lot of people that are CE Christians, Christmas and Easter. Essentially, on any given day, but even on Easter, as today, there are essentially three types of people in the pews. And I'm going to use my reason for that is Acts 17, verse 32 to 34. Acts 17, 32 to 34. There are three responses to the gospel. Acts 17, 32 to 34. And when they heard of the resurrection as Paul was preaching to them on Mars Hill, Areopagus in Athens, he preached the resurrection of the dead. Some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysus the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. There we have the three responses to the gospel. Many of them mock. And we know in the last days, as it says in 2 Peter 3, 3, and 4, that scoffers and mockers will come walking according to their own lusts. There are more and more of them in our post-Christian culture every day. There are also then a second category, those that are intrigued but not ready to believe. They may have some awakening from the Holy Spirit, but not yet onto saving faith. And then there are some, as they are even named, the few then that come to saving faith in Christ. And I'm going to address specifically the last two categories of responses, people to the gospel, but also the third one. We're not going to leave that out because through the Holy Spirit's working, even the most hardened sinner can be awakened to the gospel truths and cry out as that publican in Luke 18, 13, God be merciful to me a sinner. As we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God in Romans 10, 17. I remember growing up that there was a pastor to be who as a teenager growing up in northern Minnesota was in, as he looks back on it, a non-believing church with a non-believing pastor but that pastor got up on the Lord's Day and read a passage of Scripture. And because of that, that teenage young man came to saving faith in Christ and later went into the ministry. Luke 1, 37, with God, nothing is impossible. Last Sunday, we dealt with the first pillar of the gospel. And today we're going to deal with the second pillar of the gospel. The gospel has two pillars that are inseparable. They are inexorably linked together. The first one being the crucifixion, which is the victory over sin. The second pillar being the resurrection, which is the victory over death. You must have both of those pillars to have the gospel. One without the other, friends, is not the gospel. And here we have just read Matthew's account of the resurrection of Jesus that fits his purpose which is already stated in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew's theme is to prevent Jesus as sovereign, as king. The other themes of the gospel, just for your information, in Mark, it's Mark 10.45, the suffering servant. The son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The theme of the gospel, according to Luke, 
is the Son of Man. Luke 19.10, Jesus says, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the theme of the gospel according to John then is Jesus as the Son of God. John 20.31, the theme verse, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Matthew omits details that the other gospel accounts include as to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and vice versa. But yet we know that all four of the gospel accounts harmonize, that there is no contradiction between them at all. We see the human author's personality and writing style coming through, but what got written then was what God wanted written. That is the definition of inspiration. All scripture is God breathed out. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing that no prophecy is any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. Matthew presents an, a shortened account, but that does not deny the facts that are left out, nor does it contradict a fuller account. In chapter 28 is Matthew's inspired climax in telling, it is telling in what it does proclaim, and our prayer today is for spirit illumination this Easter Sunday for saints to glory in the gospel of Jesus Christ and their saving faith in him and their purpose in his kingdom, and for unbelievers to pray that God would open their eyes to his truth and that they'd repent of their sins and bow before the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the incarnate Son of God. As it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. 1 Peter 3, 22, Jesus Christ has gone into heaven, Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And there, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, this man, because he has an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he is able also to save them unto the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Do you believe in the resurrected Jesus? The first point this morning is the foes. The Chapter 27, verse 60 through 2 through 28, verse 4. On the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. There we see, as with last week when we were dealing with the Sanhedrin, chief priests, elders, and the scribes. Here we have the Sanhedrin also, the chief priests who were primarily of the Sadducees. We also see the Pharisees who were primarily the scribes. They're gathered together to Pilate, saying, verse 63, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver, I have that underlined in my Bible, they are mocking and scorning, they are just hateful of Jesus. That deceiver. That deceiver said, after three days I will rise. And of course they hounded Jesus in his earthly ministry from day to day. They knew every word that he ever said. And they are quoting here what Jesus had said. You remember in John 2, 19 through 22, he was referring to the temple, the temple of his body. Destroy this body and in three days I will raise it up. And his disciples did not realize he was talking about his actual body until after the resurrection, it says, that they believed the word, the word which Jesus had said. Verse 64, therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he is risen from the dead, the last deception be worse than the first. Now they want Rome and the power of that superpower of that day then to secure that tomb against all other forces so that he would stay in the grave dead. And of course their purpose from their standpoint was to prevent a hoax but we know man plans, God determines. Romans 16, 9, a man's ways are right in his own eyes, but the Lord directs his steps, his plans. Acts 2, 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, God says, you have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. And then in Acts 4, 27 and 28, for truly as your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, 
both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatsoever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. And you and I could add after all of that is that God works all things together for good. Romans 8, 28. Psalm 76, 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise God. Winston Churchill said opposition is the natural environment to effective leaders. Just think of the time from Jesus was born and Herod the Great killing the newborns at Bethlehem right through Jesus' crucifixion and burial, even when he's dead, that opposition is so adamant and hateful against him yet. And we know that they always were there hounding him. I think of that when he healed the paralytic that was let through the roof in Matthew 9. There are the scribes of Pharisees that sitting right in the front row because they want the place of honor. And why are they there? To harass Jesus, to contest with Jesus. They did the same with Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist, John 1.19. He's out in the wilderness. What do they do? They send out spies from the Sanhedrin to watch him. Opposition, friends, is the natural environment of all true believers in Christ. John 15, 18 through 20, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Because you are not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, Jesus says, therefore the world hates you. Remember what I said to you, the servant is not above his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Friends, we will experience this more and more as our culture gets more and more post-Christian and anti-Christian. As relativism reigns, the truth wanes. The ungodly power corrupts, and it corrupts absolutely. Psalm 12, verse 8, the wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. George Orwell once said, the further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. I think of how we live in this postmodern culture and that relativism is what we have today. There are no absolutes and what is truth for you is fine. What is truth for me is fine. Everyone has their own truth. We can agree to agree and to get along is to get along except that tolerance has limits when it comes to the exclusivity of Christianity, specifically the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll never forget when I was in seminary and my systematic theology professor, David Clark, drew on a board and he, go, he went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And he said, we live in this culture today that is so tolerant, tolerant is the light for it. It is the key word in society. It is the mantra of the day for everybody. But he says, everybody's fine with A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, except when you put H as Christianity. Then he says they are intolerant, as can be. Why? Because of verses like Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation, any other name under heaven, given among men whereby we must be saved. The exclusivity of Jesus Christ. This came through this last week when I got an email from Grant, uh, an individual that is in Australia. It listened to a sermon that was given on Acts 28 on this pulpit a couple years ago and administered to him, and he says he wants to minister this Easter Sunday weekend to his parents. But his parents are so anti the Bible, anti-truth. Do not accept the Bible as the truth of God. Do not accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as fact. I think of an individual that is a friend of my wife's who has cancer, and she is staying with some relatives. And in witnessing to the relatives, the discussion came around to current issues of the day, such as homosexuality, defining homosexuality, defining marriage, etc. But the bottom line is that those people that she's, those relatives that she's rooming with there, they profess Christ. But they deny that the Bible is God's word. They deny that the Bible is the truth. They deny those key truths of the Bible, that it is just filled with with myths. You see, you and I must realize that foes are as natural as the air we breathe. 
As Jesus experienced opposition, we will experience opposition. When we proclaim the truths of the gospel, we will experience the opposition, just as Jesus did. But we need to remember that when we proclaim those truths, those truths of Jesus Christ will triumph over all the foes, just as Jesus did when he rose from the grave that Easter Lord's Day. Do you believe in the resurrected Jesus? Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way, make it as secure as you can. Verse 65, what Pilate did was gave them a Roman guard, a detail of Roman soldiers. He put the authority of the superpower of the day behind that. So they went and made the tomb secure. Verse 66, sealing the stone and setting the guard. What they did was, with Pilate's okay, as they put the string across that stone and they put the stamp of Pilate, the Roman government, across that. You mess with that, and you mess with Rome. It was protected by the authority of the Roman government. Now after the Sabbath, verse 28, as the first day of the week began to dawn, there is Sunday. Sunday, the first day of the week. Before dawn, in that twilight before dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. In verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake. There was a seismos, it says in the Greek, an earthquake. For an angel Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Can you imagine the honor that that angel received? That he was the one that was going to come. And we know that Matthew speaks of one angel, the other speaks of two or more. And we don't know whether they, in terms of appearing, whether they appear and disappear, like the Pleiades, uh, the, the stars do in, the, in that in the sky or we don't know of Matthew when he's speaking he just speaks he says there's one because one is speaking and it's one because he sees only one there's one at the head of the tomb one at the base or there's one on the stone and he doesn't know where the other one is but we know that there's no contradiction here again in the gospel accounts but imagine the honor of this herald to bring this tidings think of that going back to Jesus birth in Luke 2 where that angel heralded the news there for unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior is Christ the Lord. And now at the end of Jesus' ministry you have another angelic herald here. He rolled back the stone. Really what it means in the Greek is he took that ton stone that was over 2,000 pounds that would take several individuals to roll it down an incline in a groove to seal that tomb. The angel just came and basically took his finger more or less and flicked it out of the way. Flicked it out of the groove, more or less tossed it nonchalantly to the side. And we know that the angels exceed in power, as it says in Psalm 103.20. And we know in 2 Kings 19.35, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. We know that they have supernatural power. And so the angel then rolled back that stone from that door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. There was a, a glistening to his, his, his clothing. In the Greek, it glistened. And it's like lightning and his clothing is white as snow. And we know how white it is. So there's a white glistening. It's almost like this angel was like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. And you remember Moses when he'd been in God's presence just as the angel is. What happened with Moses' face? Moses' face, it says in Exodus 34, 29, it glowed. And the guards shook for fear and they became like dead men. The guards shook for fear and, the, and they became like dead men. The word there, the root for shook, is seismos, just like the earthquake that occurred in verse 2. And friends, they shook so much because of fear. What they did is they became paralyzed, literally paralyzed, unconscious, unable to move. And yet I picked up A.T. Robertson, who I profess I, I use him quite a bit. And yet in this instance, I disagree with him wholeheartedly. He said the guards saw the angel and they fled from the scene. Well, it's a little hard to flee from the scene when you're shooking, shaking so much from fear that you end up unconscious on the ground. So much for the foes. You see there again, Christ triumphed over his foes. You and I will always have foes as he had foes. And you and I too will triumph over the foes in Christ when we boldly proclaim the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
1 Samuel 2.30, we honor him, he will honor us. We esteem him lightly, he'll esteem us lightly. Do you believe in the resurrected Jesus? The first point is the foes. The second point is the facts. 5 through 10. 5 through 10. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he's risen, as he said. Come see the place where Jesus lay. Verse 5, the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. Can you imagine that herald angel coming and the difference of his disposition between the foes, the Roman guard that was there, and the women that were there? One he'd have disdain for. The other he has mercy on. And he says, Do not be afraid. And this is something we'll see that's going to be repeated here in our text as we follow. And he says, I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Notice the tense. It is past tense. In verse 6 he says, he is not here. Why is he not here? Because he is risen. He is risen. And when he says he is risen, friends, what he's attesting to there is that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the incarnate Son of God. He is the God-man who is now glorified, who is now risen. And notice, he gives a twofold assurance here for them to back up what he says, more or less. And he says, he has risen as he said. As he said. Jesus spent his whole time telling them that he was going to do this if they had the spiritual sight and spiritual ears to see and hear. Remember, we dealt with Matthew 16, 21 last Sunday. Jesus told his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand that the chief priests, scribes, and the elders be crucified and what? And be raised again the third day. So he's risen as he said. There again, prophecy, the fulfillment of God's word, Jesus' word, the revelation of God, the revelatory word of God. And then the second thing he says here is that they can receive he is risen in another way is he said come and see the place where the Lord lay and they can do that you see why because the stone had been removed not to let Jesus out but to let the women in to verify that the tomb was empty to verify that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead. Verse 7, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. Indeed, he's going before into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I've told you. Notice that they don't linger. They don't linger in the emotion of the moment and in that particular sight. Immediately they are given duty. They are given duty to perform. They are told here, go and tell. Go and tell. Those who have seen the tomb is empty, those who know that Christ is risen from the dead, what are we to do? Bask in that? With our arms out raised and just keep glorifying in that? No. We're to glorify in it and then immediately we are to go and tell. Go and tell the great truths to disciples, to one and all, that he is indeed risen from the dead. Indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. You will see him there. There's another prophecy that's uttered by that angel. Behold, I've told you. Verse 8, so they went out quickly from the tomb. There is implicit obedience here with the fear and the great joy. It gives their joy there something then to do immediately. And they ran to bring his disciples. All protocol aside, Friends, you never saw in Israel a woman with her garment hitched up and running. Any more than you would see in the story of the prodigal son. That father, when he sees his prodigal son returning, what does he do? He hitched up his garments and he ran to his son. All protocol, protocol aside, throw it out the window. They ran to bring his disciples the word. Just think how they were bubbling over with the good news on their lips and wanting to tell, couldn't wait to tell the good word that Jesus is risen from the dead just as he had said and that the tomb is empty. Verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. Note now the, before the angel has referred to the Lord. In verse 6 he says, See the place where the Lord lay. 
But now the emphasis from the angel's lips is on Jesus met them. And what is he stressing here, friends? He's stressing Jesus' humanity. It's Jesus of Nazareth, whom you walked with and whom you talked with. This same Jesus is indeed the Son of God. He is risen from the dead. He is the incarnate Son of God, 100% God, 100% man. And Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! And so they came and held him by the feet and they worshipped him. Friends, they did not worship any phantom. They grasped his feet and they bowed before him and worshipped him. He comes out of the grave, the same brother of the flesh of each of us as he went into that grave. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my disciples to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Prophecy uttered by Jesus. Remember John 13, 19. Jesus says, These things I tell you before they come to pass that you may know that I am He, that I am God, that I am God. And what Jesus is doing here is basically repeating what the angel said before in verse 5. Do not be afraid. You go and tell my brethren. Go tell them to go to Galilee and there they will see me. You see, there's a command there to practical service over mere emotion again. R.A. Torrey says that the resurrection is the Gibraltar. The resurrection of Christ is the Gibraltar of Christian evidence and the Waterloo of infidelity. 1 Corinthians 15.3, Paul says, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Those first of all, those are truths that you and I die on. Hills that we die on. We hold these truths. And, and, and those are cornerstones of our Christianity. Christianity is built on the death and burial of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Christianity. The resurrection, friends, is the seal of the existence of God. It's the seal of the word of God. It's the seal of prophecy. It's the seal of Jesus as the Son of God. It's the seal of Jesus' words as God's word, as revelation. It's the seal that Jesus is the incarnate Lord. It's the seal that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. It's the seal of justification. It's the seal of sanctification. It's the seal of glorification. It's the seal of eternal life. And yes, it is also the seal of judgment. There is coming a day when those who do not believe in the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the gospel will be judged accordingly. Liberals today do not believe in anything supernatural or miraculous. They deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what they do, friends, is they redact the Bible words. I was listening to Rush Limbaugh on the EIB network this week. And the one day he, let, he devoted the whole three hours, basically, how the liberals today in our culture that are out in the media, that are in churches, that are in politics and that, that they are redefining all the words that this country was based on and they are redefining the words of Christianity. He is right on. They are redacting them. Redactism is where you take a word, you use the same word, but you redefine it then according to your own definition and your purposes. That is going on all over in our culture today. I'll never forget when my father-in-law, when he was alive, attended one of the mainline church services in the Wilmer area. And just as an aside, mainline is a real misnomer of terms. There are no mainline denominations today. Those that count themselves as mainline are out of line. They are totally outside the core teachings of God's Word. So my father-in-law came back from attending that one of that service and he says, they preach Christ. And I can remember very distinctly my first response to my father-in-law was, which Christ? Which Christ? They used the same words, but they redefined them to their own purposes and that. The resurrection to a liberal, what does it mean? Rudolf Boltman, who died in 1972, that German, he's one of the foremost liberals of the 20th century, said this, it is clear 
that the resurrection narrative has been composed in the interest of faith and under the influence of devout imagination. J. Grisham Machen, when he was a, a doctoral student in seminary, theology went to, to Germany and got engulfed in liberalism and almost came under its sway, but came out of it. And he wrote that great classic on what is faith. And he came out of a liberal seminary, Princeton, and founded Westminster Seminary. J. Gresham Machen died January 1, 1937, at 56 years of age. Here's what he said. Those who reject the supernatural content of the New Testament make of the resurrection just what the word resurrection did most emphatically not mean. A permanence of the influence of Jesus or a spiritual existence of Jesus beyond the grave. That's what liberals, how they redact the word resurrection today. Just a permanence of influence of Jesus or a spiritual existence of Jesus beyond the grave. And Machen went on to say that old words may be used, but the thing that they designate is gone. Friends, what do we need in our day is just what John MacArthur says in his book, Fool's Gold, the cry for discernment in a non-discerning age. That's what we need. The cognitive ability to understand, interpret, and apply doctrinal truth skillfully, or as it says in Hebrews 5.14, to judge between what is evil and good true and false. What we also need, as Walter Williams says, is a working definition of the terms that we use or otherwise we'll have nothing but confusion. Confusion reigns today because we're throwing out all these terms and nobody is defining them as they should be defined because J. Gresham Machen says definitions proceed by way of exclusion. May we have a filling of the Spirit and a boldness to, as it says in Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and refute those who contradict. May the Holy Spirit fulfill, so fill us with boldness, friends, that positively we can declare the gospel and negatively we have an apologia where we can defend the gospel against error. Do we believe in the resurrected Jesus? The first point is the foes. The second point is the facts. The third point is the fallout, beginning in verse 11 then to the end of chapter 28 through verse 20. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came to the city and reported the chief priests the things that had happened. Notice some of the guards, when they came to, some of them must have fled just for fear because they are Roman soldiers. And Roman soldiers to fall asleep on duty was a, a dereliction of military discipline. They were to be killed on the spot. So they fled for terror. But some of them thought maybe there would be a way out, so they came into the city to the chief priests. And when, verse 12, and when they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. Well, why did they bribe the soldiers? Verse 13, saying, tell them his disciples came at night, stole them away while we slept. Now, I don't know about you, but as one scholar I said, this is the most perreal, he said, explanation he's ever heard of in his life. In other words, it is the most childish, the most immature, the most absurd explanation to try and explain away the resurrection of Jesus Christ that could ever be concocted. Because how can disciples come and take the Jesus away and those soldiers know that it's Jesus' disciples that did so when they are fast asleep. It's an impossibility. And not only that, the stone weighs over a ton. And so it's going to take several of the disciples to roll that stone away from the opening and also to go in and get that body. And do you mean to say with all of that going on that nobody's going to know what takes place? And not only that, you couple that with the fear of the disciples, their abject fear and terror, and especially of all the Roman soldiers. They've already fled when they came to the garden, remember. They were nowhere to be found. And verse 14 says, If this comes to the governor's ears, in other words, to Pilate's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So in spite of the fact that you were sleeping on duty, we will 
side with you and your life will be spared. Verse 15, so they took the money. They took that bribe money and they did as they were instructed. So they went around blabbing this gross, imaginative concoction. His disciples came at night, stole them away while we slept. And then, friends, it's very instruct instructive at the end of verse 15, saying it is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. What does that tell you and I? That the masses believed in this lunatic lie. The masses believed it. Why did they believe it? Because they wanted to. Because they wanted to. Reminds me of 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap up for them teachers because they have itching ears who will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You see, we have a lot of that going on across professing Christendom in America all over the place. As Spurgeon said, the day will come when we will not have shepherds shepherding the sheep, but you will have goats entertaining fellow goats. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Has this verse ever caused you a problem? It did for me until I studied it in depth this week. Because I thought, how could the disciples, who Mary Magdalene and the women, other Mary, that they just came to him, told him that Jesus was resurrected, and we have accounts that Peter and John went to the empty tomb, they saw it, it was verified, all this, that Jesus was resurrected. How could they possibly... Then as Jesus told them to go to Galilee, they went to Galilee, just as he said that they would see him there and they saw him, a fulfillment of prophecy. How could they doubt? Well, the answer here is they didn't. But others did. Because there were other people that were also with the disciples. There may even have been a somewhat large crowd that was gathered in Galilee as news would get out of the resurrected Jesus. And Jesus came. And note, don't we have the same thing going on again? We have some believing and some that are inquiring but not ready to believe and then some doubting or mocking. You see, you probably have those same type people gathered even around the resurrected Lord there in Galilee. Verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, the word in the Greek is exousia. It means authority, legal right to act. The old King James has power. Better thing is authority there. Legal right to act. Has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And there's a Hebrew merism. You take the two extremes again. It comprises everything. Jesus as the resurrected Lord right now is at the right hand of the Father. The place of authority, honor, and dignity. He is powerful, omnipotent over all things. Colossians 1.17 is before all things and by him all things consist. And then verse 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus asserts his disciples of his power, verse 18, his commission, verse 19, and his presence in verse 20. Really, friends, what he's doing is he's saying, Go and tell. The third time, the third time in this passage, verse 7, verse 10, and now verses 19 and 20. Go, make disciples teach, go and tell. Three times raised to the superlative. Those who know the resurrection truths, those who have seen spiritually the resurrected Lord and know that as fact in their heart of hearts, what is imperative upon them? They go and tell. They go and tell. What we have here in this passage, it's interesting. We have the rejection of the Jews. And I add, for a time. I encourage you this week to read Romans 10 and 11. Paul says in Romans 11, 1, Has God then cast off his people which he foreknew? God forbid. God forbid. God is not through, friends, with the Jews yet. There is coming a time, as it says in Romans 11, 29, they will know their deliverer. They will know their deliverer. And essentially all the nation will turn to him and we know that will happen during the tribulation time period. God then turns to the Gentiles in Acts 13 46 what does Paul and Barnabas say in their first missionary journey? He says you Jews because you reject the gospel 
we turn to the Gentiles. And Jesus in Galilee here with the disciples gathered around him, the Jewish religious established, and they've rejected the gospel, so they're moving on then to the Gentiles. And secondly, we see here the expansion of the kingdom from then its narrow limits to the universal dominion with a worldwide commission. A worldwide commission. Remember the apostolic message Jesus gave his disciples, Luke 24, 46, and 47. Thus it was written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to be killed, to be raised the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Friends, are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Can you declare Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory? Are you a member of his kingdom? Are you a member of the realized kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is within you already. As it says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not in food and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And also then are you looking for that eschatological kingdom when Christ comes back in all his glory and will reign on his throne in Jerusalem in the millennium. You see, I also then, if I ask if you are in Christ, I'm also asking you then, are you part of the Great Commission? Are you proclaiming the gospel to one and all? Are you endeavoring to go and to tell? I remember when I was in seminary, there was a, a book I read called Hidden Persuaders. It said there that to have a church body thriving, you had to have 50 people. And in that 50 people, the studies were that 92% of them were present in the pews because of people who attended the church brought their friends, their relatives into the church assembly. Only 5 to 6% of those in attendance were due to the pastor. In Romans 1.16 it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There was an evangelist at the conference and he asked the audience, he says, how come people do not go and tell and proclaim the gospel. Well, many reasons were given. Fear, lack of knowledge, indifference. I'll tell you one he didn't give that he should have given. Not saved. There are many people, in fact, the majority that are sitting in pews that are not saved. They profess Christ, but they don't know Christ. He's not in their heart of hearts. And friends, you can't give away what you don't first of all possess. But then the evangelist shocked his audience. He said the number one reason why people don't share the gospel is they don't believe in the power of the gospel. And what did Paul say? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I ask each of us today, do we believe, truly believe, in the power of the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ as historic fact that it is truth that the power of God worked through it all for good to the saving of his people from their sins. Friends, I fully believe that we are in the end of the church age, the last days, it's a remnant in the church age. Matthew 7, 13, 14, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. But difficult is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And I know the church growth movement and its daughter, the emergent church today, they're wrong in two counts, as R.C. Sproul says. Number one, the purpose of the church is to reach out to the lost. That is totally anti-biblical. But that's the mantra of the church growth and the emergent church. And the second thing that they are in gross error on is that the lost are seeking God. The lost are not seeking God. They are just as in Jesus' day, that opposition, they want to kill him. They got their hands on him and they killed him. And the same thing today, the opposition to the gospel, they can't get their hands on Jesus, but they get their hands on Jesus' followers and they kill him. The lost are not seeking God, as Romans 8, 7 says, they hate God. And the reason why the church growth movement and the emergent church does not, why they are promoting that, that the lost are seeking God, is they do not believe in the depravity of man. They are like Charles Finney, want Romans 3, 4, and 5 expunged from the Bible. Throw it out. Because Romans 3, 10, and 11 says, 
As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seek after God. None that understands. They've all together gone out of the way, all together become worthless. There's none that seeks God, no, not one. Albert Muller Jr. says, the logic of the seeker-sensitive movement is if you scratch people where they itch, they'll be more receptive to the gospel. The problem is they keep talking green grass and they never get to the gospel. 1 Corinthians 14, 8. If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who's going to prepare for battle? And James R. White says, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, if you board the wrong train, it's no use running down the corridor in the opposite direction. How many times have you and I heard from people, oh, I want to minister for Christ in this body, and I want to, I think I can do this or do that and all that, and they're sitting under teaching that is not Bible-centered. It's non-exegetical preaching. It doesn't go through God's word verse by verse by verse. What they are doing is they are on the wrong train. And as Bonhoeffer says, it's no use running down the corridor in the opposite direction. Martin Lloyd-Jones says the chief feature of Jesus' preaching was to make people feel condemned. And nobody likes that. You see, the lost aren't out there seeking that kind of message. He also said the chief feature of the gospel is to inform us of the immutability of our being to be forever in one of two localities, either heaven or hell. Os Guinness, I'm reading a book right now called A Free People's Suicide. He talks about our culture, the way it's dying. Christianity is dying also. And he says there's such a disdain for history, tradition, and custom. Friends, Christianity is history. Christianity is fact. It's based on historic facts, timeless truths. Timeless truths that save people from their sins. And if we don't preach that, you see, and we disdain the tradition and the historic facts and the customs of that, then you might as well attend Kiwanis or the Rotary Club instead of going to the church meeting. As Yaroslav Pekelin said, that famous historian, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. God concurs in his word, Jeremiah 6, 16. Stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. And then one of the saddest endings ever in the Bible. But they said we will not walk therein. Friends, the great commission is for all of us. Go and tell. And as I said, it's repeated three times in this text. Three times in this text. And Jesus is the model evangelist. And when he preached to that rich young ruler in Mark 10, 17 through 22. He pointed him first to God, then he pointed him to the law, then he pointed him to repentance, and then fourthly, he repointed, pointed him to faith in Christ. Remember, the ultimate meaning of the resurrection is Thomas's words in John 20, 28. The sovereign master and God of me. That's the ultimate meaning of the resurrection for each one of us. And if that's true of us today who confess Jesus Christ, then, you see, you and I should evidence in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Therefore I glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You and I, as it says in Romans 6, 22, we were slaves to sin, now we're slaves to God. Have our fruit to holiness and the end to everlasting life. I pray go and tell would be our passion, our delight, our mandate, our marching orders from our commander in chief. That you and I would be true ambassadors for Christ expressed in our proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's good news to sinful man. Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? We've looked at three points this morning. The foes, the facts, and the fallout. Why should I worship a dead Jew? The bluntness of the question startled evangelist Alfred Ackley. The young Jewish student was sincere. He'd been attending Ackley's meetings and was wrestling with the truth. So Ackley went back to the scripture to prepare an answer and he opened to the story of Jesus' resurrection and read again, Matthew 28, 6, He is risen. Suddenly the familiar words came alive and the witness of scripture and countless believers points to one inescapable conclusion. Jesus Christ is alive. 
Ackley then led that student to Christ, and later he sat down at the piano and he composed the hymn, He Lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know he's living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. You know, that truth that Jesus is risen, is being denigrated today all over. You probably heard this last week, what happened at Florida Atlantic University. There was a professor there, a Dr. Deandra Poole, and she was, he was conducting an intercommunicational cultural course. And they were going to have this little act that they perform is they were to take a piece of paper and write the name Jesus on it, and then put that piece of paper in front of them on the floor with a name up, and then to look at that paper for a while and then think about it and then to stomp on it. And then they were to discuss what they thought of doing that to that symbol. Friends, why didn't they stomp on Buddha? Why didn't they stomp on Muhammad? You know the answer why. It's the same old story. We're tolerant of everybody except Christianity again. And when does Jesus become a symbol? Jesus isn't a symbol for you and I. He's the resurrected living Lord. And yet, that denying of the gospel truths is not only in a place such as Florida Atlantic University. And by the way, I should say on the end of that, there was only one student that stood up and complained. He went to the supervisor over that professor's head. He was expelled from class. And then he went out and got a lawyer. And then also there was such an uproar that he was reinstated to the class. And now Governor Rick Scott of Florida sent a letter to that university and is investigating the whole thing. But yet, friends, that denying of the gospel is not only outside the church. It's also within the professing church. I took my wife on a birthday outing, celebrate her birthday this week. We were going down to the Twin Cities on Highway 7 and uh, went by a cemetery located just this side, Wilmer's side of Silver Lake. And I looked over at that cemetery and there was a crucifix. There was a cross with Jesus hanging on the cross. Because what is that? It denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I just had a friend of mine this week, his dad died. A believer in Christ. Now, is there hope for him? How would you like to go to the cemetery and you're standing, you're ready to bury your dad's body in a tomb and you're standing there before a crucifix Christ on the, on the cross? What does that mean? That means just what we read for a call to worship in 1 Corinthians 15. That means that our faith is in vain. That means that we are still perishing in our sins. That means that we are of all men most hopeless if Christ is not risen from the dead, and that means that this preacher is a sham. And your faith is a sham. You see, I much rather be the Anglican bishop who when they are required, when they go to a cemetery, every time they go to a cemetery, they are to quote John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus says, I am the resurrection life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then the question, believest thou this? That's where hope lies, friends. Because he, live, he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Friends, I trust that's your testimony today. And if so, obey your resurrected Lord. Go and tell. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank and praise you for your word of truth. There's so much here, Dear Heavenly Father, but it is so great. It is so wonderful. It's so marvelous. I pray that us who name the name of Christ, that you'd fill us with that sense of wonder and marvel at it all. We'd never lose that. I pray also that you'd give us 
a filling of your spirit and a boldness then to proclaim the good news, your good news, to sinful man. That through that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there is forgiveness and remission of sins, and it's only through him. I pray that we would evidence that we truly know Christ, that we are in him, that we know the gospel.